I'm going to tell you about a classroom experiment that I like to do to teach my students about monopolistic competition and zero profits in the long run. This is a beach drinks game where they come into the classroom and I have this set up across all of the boards. So you can imagine this diagram just spread across like four different whiteboards or four different chalkboards. It takes up the whole front of the room. And this experiment gives students intuitions for a lot of economic concepts. It's, a, it's something you can refer back to as you move throughout the class. Um, here are the concepts that this demonstrates. So zero profit in the long run, monopolistic competition, economic versus accounting profits, the median voter theorem, the hoteling model, first mover versus last mover advantage, and this will also give students an intuition for why gas stations tend to locate near each other, or grocery stores, or auto dealerships. All of those tend to locate right near their competitors, and this experiment will give them an intuition for why that is. I've posted the materials for this on my GitHub, which I will link below. It's basically just a worksheet and there's also teaching notes which are basically just the solutions to the worksheet. First, I'm going to give you an overview for how this experiment works and then I'll walk through the steps in a little bit more detail. Also, this is one of students' favorite days in the semester. It's something they talk about at the end of the semester course evaluations. Students really like this experiment and generally ask for more things like this. So it's a great way of engaging students while giving them some, some new vocabulary and new concepts. This is generally how this works. So they come into the classroom and this is sprawled across many different boards. And I tell them, you are going on spring break in a week. And for me, this actually does fall near spring break, either before or after, so it's, it's perfect. And I say, this represents a 100 mile beach. And there are going to be 10 teams of you that have to decide, would you like to sell beach drinks to people on this beach? And if so, where would you like to locate, given that there's 10 other teams in the class who might also want to open a beach drinks stand? And then I, I say, okay, this worksheet is going to walk you through the preparation process, but once you've made some decisions about your team's strategy and about some other things, um, we're going to run an experiment where you actually place yourself on the beach. So one member of your team will come up and you will get to say, okay, I'm going to place myself at mile 41 and you'll put your team's name here. So this is your, your team's beach drink stand. And then the next team will come up and they'll place themselves. And we'll do that until all of the teams have either placed themselves on the board or opted out of the game. And then, once we've done that, you will calculate your profit based on the numbers in the worksheet. And we'll see who is making a profit, how much profit are you making, and what do you think would happen if we ran a second round of this game where people could enter and exit or people could move the location of their stand. And of course, we, we run the game. They will find that groups tend to cluster in various areas, which has some intuitions relating to the median voter theorem. We'll talk about how they calculated their profit, including how much money would you need to give up a day of your spring break to sell drinks. And that, of course, will relate to the opportunity cost and economic profits versus accounting profits. So that's the basic idea here. And the way to understand this diagram is that it's giving the population density at each one of these points. So at the 25th mile, this is representing the total number of people who are located at that particular mile. So we can see that there's a cluster of people at the volleyball place, there's a few more people at the surfer's place, and then there's a ton of people at the sea lions portion of the beach. So you get to place yourself according to the population density. 
Now let me talk a little bit about how you would run this. What are the steps you need and how do you interact with your class to sort of pull out the ideas from their understanding of the game. Obviously the first few steps are going to be to draw this on the whiteboard before the students arrive and match it up with the worksheet. When they arrive you explain the scenario just like I just did and you divide them into 10 teams because they're going to be running the stand as a team. And then you set them loose to work through the worksheet. And I will say you can adjust the worksheet according to the time in the semester or what you want out of this game. I have a Monopoly problem in there mainly just because it falls right after we've done Monopoly and I want them to get really good and fast at solving Monopoly games. But setting the price is totally optional. You could just give them the price. One of the more important questions for them to think about is how much money would you need to get to give up a day of your spring break to selling drinks? And talking about why is there variation in the class? What does that mean? Who is most likely to run a beach drink stand given the variation? That's that's something that you really want them to be developing an intuition for. What does opportunity cost mean? And how does it take personal preferences into account, financial situations into account, all of that stuff? Because obviously that's going to play in with economic versus accounting profit. While they're working through the worksheet, they also need to be strategizing as a team. Do they have any ideas about how to place themselves relative to other teams? Also, um, you have to pick which team goes first, which team goes last. So they need to think, which do they prefer? Do they prefer going first or last? And th this can be helpful because this is a game where there's a last mover advantage. And that contrasts, of course, with the oligopoly problems where there's a first mover advantage. So showing them that the advantage doesn't always go to the first mover, sometimes it's, it's good to, to be a second mover or a last mover, that's helpful too. And of course, the, the worksheet asks, how many teams do you think will be on the beach after all is said and done? And you can give them a lot of time for this or a little time, um, but, but you do want them thinking about how would you figure that out? And the basic way of figuring that out is, is looking at how much money is there to be made, which is essentially $1 per person times the total number of people in the table. And how does that divide across the teams? And what is the distribution of people's uh, opportunity costs? So they should be, Getting that in their head to try to do some back of the envelope calculations. How many teams do we expect to be still standing after the market has cleared? So once they've gone through the worksheet, you can talk to them a little bit about their answers, specifically the opportunity cost answer, um, first mover, last mover advantage answer, and then you pick a team to go first, a team to go last, and maybe randomly distribute it in between there. <clears throat> and then they come up and they, they place themselves on the beach. Now, your hope is that they figure out by the end of the first round that it is a good strategy to cluster. So if there's, if there's two groups that are sort of up here, let's say they don't have a perfect strategy, they're a little bit far apart, you're hoping that the last team or the second to last team is going to locate themselves right next to, to this player. Oh, and of course, you have to make sure each, when they place themselves, uh, they place themselves at a specific mile. So I'm at mile 20, mile 20. So, so, so everything is clearly labeled. But the, the best strategy here is to place yourself right next to the other team. And you can sort of work through and figure that out. And that will be a puzzle at the, at the end. You'll have to be like, why is that a good strategy? And get them to think through, why is it good to place yourself right up against that other player? And they don't always fully understand that, which is a strategic thing. So I oftentimes start explaining it over here. Let me erase this to explain. So let's say everybody has placed themselves on the board and the, the lowest mile team is at mile 20, just 
you know, just to pick a number. So we want to ask the question, why is it really good strategically to locate at mile 19 and not at mile 10? And we can answer that question by saying, okay, if we locate at mile 10, you have to divide this population between you and the group that's at 20. So there are a lot of people at miles 16, 17, and 18 that you wish you would have had and that you actually could have had if you'd placed yourself at mile 19. Because if you place yourself at mile 19, you get everybody on this side, including the people at 16, 17, and 18. So that is why it's optimal to sort of cluster in this way. Now, while you're talking about clustering, you can either talk about the median voter theorem, which kind of relates to this concept, or else usually what I'll do is I'll say, you know, keep this in mind, because when we talk about voting and why candidates tend to move toward the center after the primaries and before the general election and other things like that, we're going to come back to this clustering concept. So that tells them, ooh, I can't forget this. In fact, this is going to relate to voting, which interests me. The median voter theorem is a lot of fun. You can stop and actually talk about the median voter theorem if you want, but there's so many concepts built into this game that I find it sometimes more useful to just refer back to the game during other parts of the semester. Now, after you've finished the game and finished discussing some of the strategies, the next step is for them to actually calculate their profit. So they'll be looking at the numbers, they'll be figuring out based on the number of people who are coming to buy, based on the startup costs, how much money do they have left at the end of the day? And that's when you ask the question, will you choose to be in business? And you can kind of coax out of them, if you're only making $100 or $50, that's a positive profit. It's a positive accounting profit. But you might not want to give up your vacation days to do that, right? And that's how you develop this intuition. What's the difference between economic profit, where you account for the money you need to be willing to do this thing on the beach and work really hard all day? And that is when you talk about economic profit and accounting profit. That's when you try to develop an intuition for you could be making a positive profit, like $50 a day profit, but you're not going to be in the business. As a matter of fact, you're, you need to be paid a certain amount for this whole deal to be worth giving up a day of your spring break. And exactly how much do you need to pay for, to, for you to be willing to do this? Well, you've come up with that number. You've said, I would do this for $200 a day or $300 a day or $500 a day or whatever. And that number you came up with for wh what do I need to pay you to get you to do this? That needs to be accounted for in the profits if we're actually figuring out equilibrium. So that's how you give them an intuition for economic profits versus accounting profits. Now, once everybody has calculated their profit, then you can start talking about who would enter, who would exit. You can start asking them, what if we did this again? Who, how many teams will end up in the pool? And you can pull from them the logic of how do we end up at the right number of teams for equilibrium. And what would the distribution look like? Most likely in equilibrium, we're gonna have clustering. 